Please welcome our last speaker of this event, Michelle Bright. Michelle's the Assistant Director of the OSU College of Medicine Clinical Trials Management Organization. Michelle has nearly 20 years of experience managing clinical research trial operations, spanning the spectrum of human subjects research. Michelle is a board certified clinical exercise physiologist, and as such, she's translated her passion for cardiovascular wellness into coordination and oversight of phases one through four cardiovascular disease trials. She's routinely consulted for her expertise in study startup processes, budget negotiations, recruitment retention strategies, research compliance, and quality data management practices. In the past two years, Michelle has directly overseen and participated in five FDA inspections of clinical research trials and assist in three additional FDA inspections. Please welcome Ms. Bright. All right. Um, thank you, Rob, for that introduction. Um, I kind of have a stuff, uh, tough spot to, to be in this conference. I'm the last speaker of the day, so I know you guys are all getting kind of tired. And I'm talking about FDA, FDA inspections after the FDA, so it's kind of a <laughs> tough spot to be. So. Bear with me. Um, um, last year I spoke on um, a survival guide for surviving FDA inspections. So I'm just going to kind of build upon um, that talk and I'm going to be covering um, the good, the bad, and the ugly um, around FDA inspections. So specifically, um, I'll be covering um, an overview of FDA inspections, um, talk about some preventative and some prevention tips, um, also go over some um, actual FDA inspection outcomes. Um, I will be touching on 483s and warning letters as well, but this will be from a slightly different perspective um, than the previous speaker, um, coming from the site's perspective rather than the, the FDA's perspective. Um, I'll go over some common findings and, of course, lessons learned. Um, let me just switch something here real quick. There we go. Um, first of all, um, my first hands-on experience with uh, FDA inspections um, was when I was a newly appointed manager over what's called the Heart and Vascular Research Center. Um, we were called um, on a course of about two to three days uh, by the FDA three times, and we were going to have three separate inspections, um, three different trials, three different inspectors, three different principal investigators. Um, the only thing they had in common, they were all starting the following Monday. So had to pull all the troops together and, and get ready for these inspections. So I learned um, very quickly some hands-on experience with uh, FDA inspections. Um, believe it or not, I do find the overall experience of FDA inspections quite fascinating. Um, the topic is very interesting to me. I know some of my colleagues find that strange, um, but I do really uh, like it. So truly, I do like to uh, dig in and learn as much as I can. I'm going to be sharing with you a lot of real world experiences. Um, so throughout my talk, you will see uh, this symbol pop up, and those are going to be some actual things that we've learned um, from real uh, inspections, and I'll try and share those lessons learned with you. Um, so we'll kind of dig into uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We'll start with the good, because believe it or not, there is a lot of good uh, surrounding FDA inspections. Um, I know that's hard to believe, but there, there really is. There's tons of information. Um, so with the right information, with the right preventative actions, the right preparation, um, you definitely can have a good FDA experience. Um, and that's what I want to go over with you. So we'll start with the first topic. Um, I believe that there is plenty of information out there. Uh, we've already learned that here today. You've had a whole day of FDA experience. Um, we just had the FDA here uh, talking. Um, the FDA is very transparent. They give you plenty of information. Again, a great example on um, the previous speaker. There was nothing he was trying to hide, nothing he was trying to overlook. Um, you should not be surprised. Uh, about an FDA inspection because there's so much information out there. As he alluded to, um, they have lots of information on their website. So many things are public uh, information. Uh, he already touched upon the compliance program guidance manual, and I just cannot say enough uh, to, to back up what he said. Highly recommend that if you've not checked that out, that you do check that out. Um, it gives you step by step exactly what the inspector will be covering. Um, and that also um, came from an inspector, uh, pointed that out to me, um, and so I, had, I was not aware that that existed. So hopefully you learned that today, and then um, I had learned that from an inspector. Another tip I would give you is on their website, you can click on this link and you can sign up to get um, email updates. Uh, yes, I, I like to get the email updates, and I know several of my colleagues like to get the updates as well. So I highly recommend that you do that um, if you're involved in a lot of FDA research. 
Um, if you're not already, which you hopefully should be if you're in this room, you should definitely be familiar with the, the Code of Federal Regulations and all the FDA guidances that are out there um, pertaining to the area of research that you work in. Um, if you uh, want to go to one-stop shop to get all these, again, all on the FDA's website. So you can learn so much just by checking out that one website. So plenty of information, no reason you should be blindsided about what the FDA is there to inspect uh, when they're at your site. Uh, I know a little bit of this was covered, but again, I'm going to cover it from a slightly different perspective. Um, because the FDA is so transparent and there's so much you can learn on their website, um, I th highly recommend that you, you take advantage and know as much about them prior to the inspection. So we've already talked about who you're dealing with, um, the BIMO program. Um, represented here today was the CDER. I work in devices a lot, so the CDRH is another center that I would work with. Uh, some more about the basics, uh, what? Uh, again, covered a little bit uh, earlier today and uh, just previously. Uh, they're not just monitoring you as a site. They're monitoring all these uh, different areas. Uh, I'm coming at this, again, from a clinical investigator uh, standpoint because um, I've only been through site uh, uh, FDA inspections. Um, I want to reiterate the objectives here. Again, I know they were covered, and I really like the way that they were covered in the previous presentation, but can't stress enough that if you keep these objectives in mind, I think that also will help put your inspection um, in perspective. They're not there, as he said, to find what you're doing wrong or to make your life difficult. Um, they're not there to absolutely issue you a 483. Um, they're there to do these three very important things. So prior to an inspection, I always kind of remind myself of these three objectives just to, again, kind of put things in perspective and take away a little bit of that anxiety. It's not personal. They're here to um, uphold those three objectives. Uh, the why. Um, this was touched on, but I'm going to take a little different angle to it. Um, why, were, uh, why are you as a site being inspected? Um, two main reasons um, that they talked about could be routine. Um, that could be for the pre-market approval application um, or part of the FDA's early intervention program. So your study could still be enrolling or in follow-up and they still may come and inspect you. Um, or it could be directed for cause, um, as, they, uh, as he talked about in his presentation, on um, some of the complaints that they get or reports that they get. Um, some insight onto possibly why your site in particular might be chosen. Um, and a lot of this is just, again, from talking to um, some FDA inspectors, uh, investigators, and hearing their, their uh, point of view on this. But anything that's an outlier with your site could potentially red flag you for um, an inspection. So the number of subjects enrolled at your site, that could be high or that could be low. Um, number of subjects whose data is excluded. So if you have a high number, higher than expected number of screen fails, or maybe you have no screen fails and there should have been some screen fails. Um, inspection history of the investigator. Maybe your investigator's never been inspected, and so they're a new investigator, they want to check them out. Um, or maybe your investigator's had a warning letter or a 483. Inconsistent data. Maybe you've had a higher number than expected uh, AEs, hospitalizations, things like that. So anything that kind of puts you on the fringe might get your site uh, chosen. Uh, again, sticking with the transparency idea that there's so much information out there. Um, on the FDA, uh, they have all kinds of statistics on their website. So when you're poking around and clicking around on their website, you can find all kinds of stuff. Numbers, um, they break it down by fiscal year. This is the most current information. They didn't have fiscal year 2018 um, on their site yet. Uh, again, I've only had experience with the clinical investigator, um, but you can see that's kind of the bulk of their inspections. Again, just some more statistics because I'm kind of a FDA stats nerd. Um, that just shows you all the um, BIMO inspections uh, broken down by fiscal year. So really no trend in that. Um, they do quite a few each year. Uh, again, mentioned earlier was that compliance program guidance manual. Just stressing again that you should absolutely go check that out. In particular to you as the site, uh, part three is what you want to really read. Um, starts on page 11. Sad that I know that. Um, but that is the section you're going to read. Actually goes through exactly what uh, they're going to cover during that inspection. So to break it down just a little bit, um, I'm not going to read all of this to you, but these are some of the things that we have had um, experience with covered in any of the investigations that we've had. And each of these points are covered in that uh, manual. So you can kind of read through those. 
specifically, coordinators always want to ask me, what are they going to look at for subjects? There's no way they can review every single subject, every single data point, and, and that's true. So more specifically with subjects, the things they're going to focus on is the data. Is it what's on the CRF? Is that complete and is it accurate? Does it match your source documentation? Uh, does the subject exist? Yes, they have to verify that. Um, you'd be surprised. Um, subjects, are they meeting inclusion, exclusion criteria? Um, the clinical testing, is it documented in the EMR or in the medical records somewhere? Um, are all the AEs documented? So you know they're going to focus on AEs and were they reported appropriately? Um, and then was, did the investigator appropriately do what they needed to do with the AEs as well? Um, and then concomitant therapies and concomitant medications. Those would be your big things to really focus on, that they'll really focus on during the investigation. So highly recommend, again, that you go check out that, um, that compliance program guidance manual for further detail, especially if you've never been through an inspection. Um, that'll just help you see uh, what they're going to be covering. Um, another good topic uh, surrounding FDA uh, inspections would be not only is there plenty of information, but you have plenty of resources. So outside of um, the FDA giving you so much information, you should have a lot of other resources um, at your uh, fingertips. Um, institutional resources, so the IRB, the Office of Research, Office of Compliance, they all can help you either in clarifying some of the guidances or helping you prep or prepare for an inspection. Uh, departmental resources. Uh, hopefully your department or your division or your, your group has SOPs. Um, the College of Medicine um, has SOPs that our coordinators follow. And specifically, um, we have one on FDA inspection. So I recommend that you have one of those. Um, your research administrator, your manager, your team, the principal investigator, everybody should be a resource for you. It's not, you're not a one-man show when you get that call from the FDA. Everyone should be helping you prepare and, and get ready for these inspections. And, of course, we have the Internet, good and bad tool. Um, there's plenty of information out there um, on FDA inspections, not just from the FDA, but from all kinds of other groups um, that have been through inspections. There are checklists, there are articles, there are webinars, plethora of information. Um, just obviously use with caution and make sure you're, you know, the information is from a reputable source. Um, but no reason that you shouldn't know what you're getting into. Um, so if you do your research ahead of time, um, there should be no reason that you um, don't have, that you can re relieve some of that initial anxiety um, before the FDA gives you a call. Something else that is good uh, related to FDA inspections, I feel there's plenty of time, and I know that seems a little contradictory. Most of us think about when you get that call, uh, you have maybe seven to ten days or so to get ready. Um, so what am I talking about? How is there plenty of time? That doesn't seem like enough time. Um, if you attended my talk last year, and I'm going to kind of summarize some of that um, again this year, um, I kind of break it down into two areas. There's prevention, which really should start um, with day one of the study. So you can't prepare for an audit only when you get that call from the FDA. Too late to be preparing. You need to start day one. And then, yes, there, of course, is some preparation once you get that call from the FDA. There are some steps that you can do to really kind of do a final cleanup, final preparation, so you can put your best foot forward. Um, as I mentioned, typically seven to ten days is what you have, so still uh, not a lot of time. Um, so you should have a plan in place and, and have some uh, tips ready to, to prepare for that. So I'm going to break down some of the prevention and preventative tips. Uh, we'll start with prevention. Um, a quote uh, that I like that I think describes this very well is uh, from Benjamin Franklin, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Um, so kind of take my top three prevention tips and, and give you some tips within those tips. So the first uh, prevention tip I would say is principal investigator, investigator oversight. And this is referring to PI footprint. You need to have that PI footprint. And as you can see, this can't start when you get the call from the FDA. This has to start from the beginning, implement it from the start, and carry it throughout the entire study. Specifically, some things that I'm uh, referring to with this um, are listed up here. And again, these are all some real-world things that have come from either suggestions from um, uh, inspectors um, or things that we've implemented post-inspections. 
in particular that first one, uh, regular study team meetings with the PI. I think I've heard that throughout a couple talks today. Um, having that regular touch base, but it's important to document that and, and have that recorded. Otherwise, uh, you know, there's no proof that it happened. Um, but that was, we got some good feedback from an inspector on that, that we had a trial where we had regular study team meetings and they liked, they saw that we had documentation on that. Um, have that PI definitely be involved in the uh, eligibility review, so signatures on the inclusion exclusion checklist. Um, document involvement in the consent process, also another real world um, example of some process improvement that came from um, an inspection that we had. Um, we have a consent process checklist that's in the uh, College of Medicine SOPs that kind of originated from some feedback from the FDA, has since been continued to be kind of tweaked along the way, and again, we get good feedback on that because it's an excellent way to document that consent process and the PI's involvement. Um, make sure the PI is reviewing and signing source documents. Coordinators are always good about that, but making sure you're circulating that around um, to get signatures as needed with the investigators. Timely review of labs A and AEs and SAEs, so make sure you have a process in place um, that those aren't sitting in a bin somewhere for a couple of months. Safety labs can't sit um, and not be reviewed um, in a timely manner. You can route research notes in the EMR. That can help show some PI footprint. Um, the PI is available during routine monitoring visits. Those monitoring visit follow-up letters will often say PI not available, PI not available, one right after another, and that was a red flag to um, one of our FDA inspectors um, that it showed that the PI just was never available for those. So we understand they're busy, uh, the, the sponsors understand that, the FDA understands that, but if they can at least make you know, every other one um, or make an effort to follow up after the visit. Um, likewise, if they are present on conference calls or attend investigators meetings, make sure you're showing um, their attendance with those. Um, so just some you know, quick tips on ways to show PI footprint. Um, another prevention tip uh, would be organized essential documents. Um, an organized regulatory binder can set the tone early on for an inspection. Um, almost always, I think, thinking back, I think all of our inspections, that's what they've started with. Please give me your reg binders. They start there, spend the first day or two. So if that's organized, that just gets you right off on the bat, off on the right foot. Um, some tips for an organized essential documents binder would be um, that signed, uh, FDA 1572 or investigator agreement also kind of mentioned I think earlier on today, but making sure there's a lot of moving pieces and parts during study startup, making sure that gets signed and filed right off the bat from the beginning and is accurate and correct. Um, the DOA log, training log, um, updated CVs and medical licenses, kind of combine these together into a kind of a real world tip. And um, I like that I heard the previous speaker touch on this as well. Um, we had an inspector talk to us about just because you're delegated to something where you actually trained properly and did your CV actually show you were qualified. So those three things have to all uh, communicate together. So making sure right from the beginning that you've got, um, as mentioned earlier, qualified staff uh, doing these things and that they're delegated. Um, financial disclosure forms or conflict of interest. Um, kind of pulling this one out as a, a real world tip as well. Um, we had an inspection where the financial disclosure forms were a little bit of a hot mess. They were a little confusing. It was hard to tell. Uh, there were some conflicting information between what the sponsor had and what was on the financial disclosure forms. And it really delayed the inspection and the inspector got very hung up on trying to sort that out. And it set the tone for the rest of the inspection. It was constantly brought up and, and reiterated that that was not correct. And those forms, I know as a coordinator, those can be easily overlooked during study startup. They don't seem important to you, but they're definitely important to the FDA. So making sure you're getting those right from the beginning and, and uh, maintaining them throughout the study. And then you can kind of read through here the rest all versions of the protocol, IRB approvals, making sure that account of, uh, device or drug accountability records are, are complete, and all types of reports, um, either safety or annual reports, are filed as well. If you have regulatory staff working closely with them to make sure that this binder is as complete as possible from the beginning and maintained throughout um, would be a great prevention tip. Third prevention tip. Um, has been mentioned many times um, today. Document, document, document. Um, I know it's very cliche in research to say that if it wasn't, if it wasn't documented, it didn't happen. But it's so true, especially with an FDA inspection. You're handing the inspector, the investigator, um, all your binders, all your files. They're going away into a room, and yes, they call you in and, and talk to you. But they're really just leafing through that. So those need to tell a story 
from start to finish, your reg binder from start to finish, each subject binder from start to finish. So documentation can help fill any of those gaps in there um, that they might have questions about. So filing your correspondence um, from pretty much everybody and anybody in there. Uh, we already talked about the consent process, making sure that's documented. Um, I would like to point out thorough study progress notes. That seems like a given, um, but we had an um, inspection where the, the research nurse was an excellent, excellent documenter, and there were many instances where it probably saved us from getting a 483 with that inspection. We had some very kind of confusing, complicated AEs. Uh, a lost follow-up patient was a little confusing, but all her excellent documentation told the story of that and, and answered all of the inspector's uh, questions. Um, missed visits, lost to follow up, screen fails, withdraws, have lots of documentation surrounding those um, scenarios so that you can easily address those. Um, AEs, SAEs, um, and then notes to file, I draw a little attention to that as well. Make sure you're using them only as needed. Um, they can be a, a red flag to point like, look here, here's where we missed something or didn't do something right. Um, but they also can serve a purpose to fill a gap in the, in the documentation. So just make sure you're using them as needed and appropriately. So maybe work with um, research administration or managers to make sure that you're putting the right information in there and, and writing them appropriately. So document, document, document. Um, jumping over to the preparation side, we'll stick with Benjamin Franklin for a quote for this one as well. Um, by failing to prepare, uh, you're preparing to fail. So I by no means am saying if you do all that preparation that there's no need, or all that prevention that there's no need to do some last minute prep. There still is a, a need to do last minute prep when you get that call. You do still need to uh, kind of jump into action. I'm going to summarize for you um, kind of my top 10 preparation tips. Now you typically only have, as I mentioned, roughly seven to 10 days when you get that call, possibly even shorter. Um, so this is not the time to do a big thorough review. It's too late for that, as I've already mentioned. And I find that coordinators will tend to go down rabbit holes and just start to spin out of control. So you need to have kind of a plan for this preparation so that nobody goes wildly off track. Um, so I would consider kind of this whole slide one big um, green thumbs up. All of these are tips um, from previous inspections um, that we have had. So uh, we try to have um, an inspection readiness team, not an official team necessarily identified, but we definitely pull on our senior staff members um, and those that have been through FDA inspections um, to help get uh, other teams ready. So it doesn't matter if, if you worked on that team or not, everybody can kind of pull in and help. Um, reviewing 100% of the ICFs, I do think that's time well spent, although that can be you know, time consuming, but they're absolutely gonna check that, so that is worth uh, looking over. Um, review those essential documents. There shouldn't be much to do. Maybe you're just behind on filing, um, but if you put those prevention tips in place, you should really just have to clean that up a little bit. Um, ensure corrective and preventive actions um, are well documented and closed out. So if the sponsor put you on a CAPA, make sure that that was that was um, closed out and it's not just an open, um, what's the point of a CAPA if you didn't actually follow through with it. Uh, check the training documents. Again, at this point, too late to, to fix them necessarily, but just review them and make sure they're clear and accurate and complete. Um, verify your IRB approvals. Um, this one's kind of a big one, but ensure the PI um, followed the protocol and subjects. I know that seems broad, but what you should do is leaf through um, the subject binders and just look for any red flags that if, you know, kind of put on your inspector hat and what would you pull out? Um, an example of this in a recent um, inspection, we knew we had a patient that um, was not incarcerated at the beginning of the study, but became incarcerated throughout the course of the study. That's kind of an outlier. We figured they were gonna target that subject a little bit to make sure we had done all the proper reporting. So we just reviewed that subject in a little more detail to make sure everything, you know, all our I's were dotted and T's were crossed. Not that there was anything we had to, you know, to do or fix or clean up, but we just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page about that patient. And yes, the inspector did focus a lot on that particular subject, um, but, but all was good. Uh, verify SAEs, so similar to the, uh, the previous one, um, think about any kind of outlying SAEs that you had, if you had a very complicated one, or one where the subject was hospitalized for 30, 60 days, um, kind of the bigger SAEs, or if it's an SAE that maybe hit an endpoint of the protocol, um, that might be one that they're gonna target. So just reviewing those so that you're able to speak to those when the inspector uh, asks you questions. 
Uh, check your IP accountability, just make sure that's accurate and complete, and review your monitoring follow-up letters. Make sure you have them all, and if you don't, you can reach out to the sponsor to get any ones that you're missing. And similar to the CAPAs, look to see if there's any open action items that maybe you can quickly clean up that haven't uh, been cleaned up. And specifically, kind of Michelle Bright's specific final preparation tips is kind of what I do. Um, this isn't really written down. You're not going to find this you know, on the internet or any SOP. This is just kind of my own, what I jump into when I get the call from the FDA. Um, I like to set up a room near where we're going to put the FDA so that we can have a little bit of a staging area, so that there is a quiet place where the study team can go if they need to take a break or if they need to, as he mentioned, spread out all the records and do a little bit of their own digging at the end of the day to help address a question that the uh, investigator has. Um, we have a little invest, uh, FDA inspection kit that we put in there that just includes all the necessities to get through the inspection, um, signs to, for the door just to tell people that there's an inspection going on, stamps, hole punch, uh, just anything that you would need. I even usually include some snacks, refreshments, just to kind of be supportive to the study team. Um, our regulatory compliance officers, because we have those in the CTMO, they will start to review the reg binders for us, so then our study team um, can focus more on the subject binders, and then I, as an administrator, will kind of start to type up some um, notes that we can go over with the whole team so that we're all on the same page. I usually write a little opening meeting script because I know the anticipated questions that will occur during the opening meeting, so I'm just prepared to answer those. And a little study overview summary, how many subjects, how many AEs, when did we stop enrollment at our site, just any kind of high-level high um, uh, timeline or, or milestones with that study so that we're all on the same page. Once all those reviews are done, we do meet um, with the entire study team, discuss the opening meeting um, and how that will go. Um, we have an investigator slide set that one of our coordinators put together. That was one of her projects back in the day, and we review that with the investigator. It just gives them, from their perspective, some tips on how to deal with the FDA. Um, study overview summary, we just review that real quick, and then I do go over some FDA um, inspection etiquette uh, pointers with uh, the staff, and then also email a notification to other staff, just so they're aware there's an inspection um, occurring. So it's just, again, just my own little things that I do kind of the last couple of days before the inspection. Um, so even with all the great uh, preventative and preparation, you still may end up with um, the bad side of an inspection, a 483. And I know this has been covered uh, you know, previously, but I'm going to brush over it a little bit more, and again, just from a slightly different perspective, from more of the site's perspective, um, and some tips on dealing with 483s. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, 483 is just a list of inspectional observations. Um, and we talked about, uh, it's been talked about earlier that you can respond uh, verbally um, or written or, or both. Um, 483s are technically public documents. They're just a little harder to get a hold of, but because of the Freedom of Information Act, you can get them. You just have to be patient and go all the right steps to get them. But just want you to be aware they are public. Um, some significant findings that, um, that I have encountered, either through inspections that I've been through or, or have helped with, um, you can kind of read some of these up here. A couple um, to point out um, is definitely the, the no informed consent or informed consent documentation. Um, that's obvious, that's why I think it's important to spend a lot of time on the informed consent in the preparation. Uh, minor clerical errors throughout, I know that seems uh, like a nitpicky one, but uh, the key is if it's a lot and if it's consistent and if it's throughout the entire study. So an example of that would be consistently forgetting to fill in the header on a worksheet every single time. That would uh, be something they'd have to potentially um, have a finding on. Um, definitely source not matching the CRF. Um, we already talked about PI footprint. They're going to be looking for that. Um, and they're definitely going to focus on AE and SAE, so a finding could come out from that if there wasn't proper PI assessment. Um, specifically, straight from the FDA's website, because again, they're very transparent, give you all kinds of information on their website. This is fiscal year 2017. These were the most common findings, um, so it kind of matches the list that I had up there before. But you can find that on their website. And just some more statistics again, because that's what I do. Um, 243 uh, 483s were issued in 2017. Again, they don't have 2018 da data out there just yet, um, but gives you an idea of the number of 483s that are issued. Um, 
while you're not required, as we talked about, uh, to submit a res written response, it's highly recommended um, and it's considered good practice. So you definitely uh, should consider that. And I know we touched on this, or it was touched on in the last presentation. Um, I want to take a slightly different approach to it. I will say I changed this slide out last minute when I saw who the keynote speaker was because I had his nine tips because that was in an ACRP article. I had his nine tips for responding to a 43. Had a feeling he would be better at covering his own tips than I would be. So found a different article to cover for you guys today. Um, this is the, um, believe it or not, it's called the five tips, but there are six tips that were covered in the article. So I don't know the six tips up here. Um, be clear, so make sure it's clear. This is, you don't need to write a literary work of art. It doesn't need to be flowery. You don't even need to use your thesaurus. Just be clear and concise. Be compelling, be sincere. Write it from the PI's perspective. Um, that is um, completely fine. Um, anticipate potential questions. Um, so don't bring up something that you think is gonna make more questions. You don't want them to wanna you know, continue to respond back and forth with you because that, that could happen. Just answer the main issue, the main observation, and stick with that. Uh, carefully manage your disputes. So yes, you can disagree, and as uh, mentioned in the previous presentation, you should let them know if you agree or disagree. But if you're gonna disagree, just pick your battles wisely. Make sure you have objective data to support that. Um, support all claims, not just disputes, but all claims with facts and hard data. Um, we always have lots of attachments that go along with our 43 responses as actual source documents um, or evidence, if you will, um, hard data to support um, any claims that we make. Uh, and assess your responses for quality and thoroughness. Um, in this article, they, they said it's very important to proofread and have many people read it over and over and over, which again is ironic that they're that the title of their article was incorrect. It should be six tips for writing an effective 483 response, um, but that's fine. Um, one that I would add to this is kind of my own, is don't overcommit. Uh, you want to try and uh, you know get out of uh, getting any kind of warning letters, so sometimes people tend to want to, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. All these great ideas come to mind. Don't overcommit, because if they come back and inspect you or ask for further evidence and you haven't followed through, that's worse than the not saying you were going to do something. So please uh, make sure that you keep that in mind. So again, just some of my own personal uh, Michelle Bright's resp uh, response tips. You're not going to find these in an article. They're just my own. Um, the first time I had to write a 483, it was, or a response to a 483, it was a pretty messy, long um, in, inspection, um, and the PI for that did already have a warning letter, so I was shaking in my boots about the fact that we had to write this response. So I certainly hit the books. I read all these different tips and tricks, and I read the nine responses, I read these responses, um, and worked very hard to make sure we had the best possible response that we could. Um, research administration um, works with the PI, so I don't let the PI just write it themselves. I don't write it. It's a collaborative thing. Um, it should come from the PI, but I do help them write it. Um, I reference previous response letters from our site, so I look to see uh, what else uh, we have said, what has been successful, what's not been successful, and again, I don't overcommit to anything. I choose to follow kind of a corrective, uh, formal kappa model to the way I write mine. You can write it just very paragraph by paragraph, but I break mine down um, by root cause analysis, and again, this was covered earlier. We take ownership as needed. Um, we'll implement any immediate corrective action plan. We'll discuss any long-term corrective action plan. Definitely outline a preventative action plan, um, and we define how the action will be followed up, so dates and supportive documentation. Um, I personally like to use actions that are easily documented. Um, Maybe that's just the coordinator in me, um, but training or retraining, something that's easy to document, process improvement, a new or revised SOP, those are easy, hard documents that you can send in um, as proof or evidence um, of your action plan. It should be written, um, I write it in the first, per uh, first person from the PI's point of view. Use pleasantries, be polite. Um, you should CC or send a copy um, to the inspector that issued you the 483. You'll be sending your response to the director of your, your district um, center, um, so CC and send a, a copy to your inspector. Um, include supportive documentation, kind of touched on that, and then just I personally aim to send it by 10 days. I don't want to be down to the, the wire and miss that 15-day mark, so I shoot for 10 days to give us a little bit of a buffer. 
Next comes another kind of bad part of inspections. You have to sit and wait, and this is the part that I'm not good at, I'm not very patient. Um, you send in your response and you don't hear back right away. You spend all this time drafting this, you know, this great document and sending it in and you have to sit and wait. So as kind of explained in the previous presentation, the inspector has 30 days to write their report and then the agency is gonna take that along with the 483 and your response, put it all together and that's when they'll make their decision. So a lot of sitting and waiting and you're not really hearing any updates along the way. You just have to wait till you uh, hear back. And I won't go too much into this uh, since it was covered pretty well in the last presentation, but these are the three potential outcomes, the NAI, VAI, and OAI. More statistics, but just from a different angle than the last presentation, gives you an idea last fiscal year how many um, OAIs, 1% of all of the inspections uh, resulted in that. Um, the majority of them were NAIs. And I know there were some examples of actual responses last time, but I feel like we can't get enough of these because this is kind of how you learn. How did people respond improperly so that you can respond properly? Um, so an observation technically on the 43 was the wrong version of the protocol was used. In this case, uh, and these are not examples from any of my, my groups, by the way. These are just abstract examples. Um, from other, other institutions. A new version of the protocol was available and it was IRB approved, but the site was using the previous version. So the clinical investigator's response was very blame shifting. They said it was the study monitors uh, failed to inform them. I think we know that that would not uh, fly with the FDA. No, it's the inspector's responsibility. So that's not an appropriate response. Um, another observation, incorrect data. Um, in this case, there was a score, a pain score, um, that the, the uh, coordinator miscalculated, and that score deemed that participant ineligible, but because it was miscalculated, they were, they were already enrolled. Um, so the clinical investigator, again, very quick to blame shift, put this on the, the coordinator, that just simply said the coordinator miscalculated. Well, okay, but there was really no additional follow-up. So, not adequate, um, no documentation, no retraining. Um, that's great that you identified what the problem was, but you didn't really say how you were gonna correct it. Um, another example, um, this case, failure to follow investigational plan, which is quite broad, but in this case, um, the patient was enrolled before central labs were back, and once the central labs came back, um, it turned out they were not eligible, but they kept them in the study anyways, and you'll see why. Um, long explanation, but the bottom line is the investigator just felt it was their clinical judgment um, was right and that they should remain in the study. So that is a blatant failure to follow the investigational plan. So no, the FDA did not accept that. Um, the protocol doesn't allow you to use your investigational judgment. You're supposed to follow the inclusion exclusion criteria and enroll eligible subjects. Um, so not an appropriate response. Um, so hopefully you follow all the tips that we've given you throughout the day on how to respond and you don't respond like this um, because the ugly side of investigations um, can get a little bit worse. Um, a warning letter or potentially even worse, we'll talk about that here in a moment. Um, so warning letters um, are uh, just that, they're issued for violations on um, which are regulatory significance. Um, their advisory, they don't commit the FDA to taking any enforcement action. Um, whereas responding to a 483 is somewhat optional, though not recommended, it's definitely not optional to respond to a warning letter. Um, you would respond in a similar fashion, you just should probably involve some higher ups, involve more leadership, possibly involve legal. It's just a much more significant um, response that you'd have to write. Warning letters are also public. Um, but they're very public. These ones are easily accessible. Um, they're on the FDA's website. Um, if you click on the, the link there or Google uh, warning letters on their website, search their warning letters, there's a database where you can see every uh, warning letter uh, there or you can do a search and look for a specific one if you had one in mind. So uh, you can go around and uh, go on their website and read a couple of those. Um, much like 43s, I wanted to provide you a couple examples of warning letters. Don't worry about reading the whole thing. I can kind of summarize it. And I think these slides are gonna be available afterwards um, anyway, so you can read it a little bit more closely. Um, but this is an example where the sponsor was told to get an IDE prior to starting their, their, their uh, trial. They did not, they enrolled subjects. When they were investigated, um, they, they were you know, cited for not having an IDE. Their response back was they still don't agree that they needed to do an IDE application. I really think that's a losing battle. Um, you really should sort that out well before you start your study, whether you need an IDE or not. So I think it's a given why they got a warning letter. Um, subject eligibility. Um, in this case, 
two subjects were enrolled that did not meet um, inclusion criteria or met an exclusion criteria, I forget which it is. Um, doesn't seem like that big of a deal to patients, but they had only enrolled four patients total. So the FDA looked at that as 50% of your, your subjects were not eligible. So that was a safety concern and, and welfare concern, as well as a, a data a validity and integrity concern. So that got them a warning letter. Lack of documentation, um, so just to point out why document, document, document is so important. Um, the site was supposed to um, do a follow-up after a safety lab and adjust the dose on a patient, and they kind of never got around to it from what I can tell. Um, their response to the, the FDA was that it was a non-compliant patient, and they tried, but they just couldn't get the patient in. However, they had no doc documentation of that. There was no documentations of phone calls or letters or anything being sent to the patient to show that they did make every attempt to follow up with the patient. So therefore, it didn't happen. So they got a, a warning letter for that. Failure to maintain accurate device records, and that's probably a kind heading because in this case, they had absolutely no documentation um, of device uh, disposal or use, who it was used in, when it was used, where it was stored, they had no device records whatsoever. Um, so this got them a warning letter. Informed consent, again, always a big topic. A good chance that that will potentially, at the very least, get you a 483, if not a warning letter. Um, in this case, a couple patients were uh, had some study activities done to them prior to signing consent. Um, the site did do a, a good response, I feel, from what I can tell from this. Um, they created a couple new SOPs, they had some process improvement, and the FDA does acknowledge that that was all great. Um, however, just because it was such a serious concern with um, consent, they still issued them a warning letter. Um, this is why following all the, the tips you've received today on responding to a 43 is important. Um, in this case, the FDA said that their response was inadequate. It didn't include any of the tips that we went over with you. There was no corrective action. Um, there was no specific time frames, no supporting documentation. Um, so that was one of the things that contributed to them getting uh, a warning letter. Um, in addition to that, um, this is stressing the point that I said about not over committing. Um, this investigator had been uh, had been issued a 483 in the past, had written an adequate response at the time, um, but during this inspection, they realized that all the things that they said they were gonna do, they really didn't do, and they were continuing um, with the same violation. So it does no good just to tell them you're gonna do something, because again, they can come back and check. And we have had the same study inspected twice. Um, we've had a study inspected um, during the early intervention program, so the study was still enrolling in, or in follow-up, I think it was, and then they did come back once then the sponsor submitted for their, their PMA. So it was inspected twice. We didn't have a 43 for either of those, but had we had one with the first one, they absolutely would have followed up and to see if we were doing what we said we were doing. Um, so warning letters can um, turn into further regulatory actions, and I think it's important to make sure you that you do understand that hopefully based on everything you've learned today, um, you're never gonna see this side of an FDA inspection, but it is possible. Um, there can be a notice of uh, initiation of disqualification proceedings and opportunity to explain. Um, there can disqualify a clinical investigator, um, and it can potentially lead to a criminal investigation and even debarment. So there are some serious consequences if you don't um, adhere to these uh, tips that we've given you today. Um, wanted to kind of wrap up by giving you um, a real world example of one of our um, 483s, how we responded, and the outcome of it. Um, so from one of our investigators, and although these are public documents, I did redact it just so I didn't put anybody on total public blast. Um, so if you've never seen a 483, and again, you're not meant to read everything that's on there, just gonna highlight some of the points of it, but that's the 483 uh, form. Um, I wanted to point out that it is issued to the investigator, a little blurry up there, but it's not issued to the site, it's issued to the investigator. Um, it is a list of observations, as we said, so they'll list each and every observation singly, and they will give you specific examples. So it won't be a general observation. Um, they will give you very specific examples of, um, of, what, you, of what they found during their uh, investigation. This particular one was a one observation, but they did have an A, B, and C, and they listed each one of those out separately, but it was all the same observation. Um, in the end, uh, as we said, the investigator can respond verbally. In this case, our investigator chose to say 
he promised to correct. Not exactly how I would recommend him um, verbally responding, but that's fine. We knew we were going to follow up with a written response, so at least it was short and sweet, and I guess he didn't completely overcommit. Um, again, not the best. Uh, Real-world response to this 483. Um, so again, a lot up there, but point out some of the highlights. Um, it was submitted on July 19th, and that was within 12 days of the, uh, the response, or the 43 being issued, so we were well within the 15 days. Um, we addressed it um, to the uh, director of the Cincinnati District Office. Um, we used pleasantries like, dear Mr. Uh, Barber. We wrote it in first person using words like my and I, we. Um, the format that, again, I chose to use, we review the issue, a corrective action, and then a preventative action. We included attachments. We had due dates. Um, we took ownership where necessary. So I think we hit a lot of the highlights that we, we've talked about here today. Um, although it was one observation, we did address each A, B, and C uh, separately, and we just used the same format. We used that review of the issue, the corrective action, and the preventative action. Uh, we ended with taking, again, general responsibility. Um, the PI recognized, in this case, it was a co-PI. Um, he took uh, accept accepted responsibility for the oversight of the trial. Again, used some pleasantries. He made himself available. Please don't hesitate to call me. He provided his personal cell phone number. And uh, then, again, we CC'd and uh, copied, sent a copy to the inspector that gave us the 483. So I feel like we hit a lot of the, the high points um, of the tips that we've given you here today. Um, the letter that we got back from the FDA, um, it was just a letter of findings. Um, so uh, some key things with this, just to, uh, again, express the timeline, we submitted that on July 19th. We didn't hear back from the FDA until September 14th, so that's, to me, a long time to have to sit and wait and hear if it was an adequate response. And bottom line was it was an adequate response. Um, they were happy with our preventative and, and corrective action plan. Um, they just pointed out, please make sure you do have proper documentation of the training. Um, because at the time we said we'd complete the training in August, you only have you know the 15 days um, as was mentioned to to submit your response. So the training had to occur after we submitted um, the response. So they just said to make sure that we did that, and we did. We have that documentation on file um, because they pointed out that in future inspections they can certainly ask for that documentation. So we have that ready to give them if they need it. Um, but bottom line that I was looking for in this was that there's no response needed. So this kind of closed out this case for us with the FDA um, as far as the FDA is concerned. So to summarize the outcome of this, um, no warning letter was issued. And again, this was an example um, of that I mentioned earlier, the PI already had a warning letter, so we were very excited to know that we didn't get another warning letter uh, issued. Uh, no further action required by the FDA, and I kind of stress required by the FDA, because I, as a research administrator, do require some additional action after this. We huddle afterwards, we discuss the good, the bad, and the ugly of that particular inspection. Um, what can we learn from it? How can we process and prove? Have we closed out all the corrective and preventative action plans. Specifically in this case, um, three big things came out of this process improvement. We developed a reconsenting tracker tool um, that the team uses to this day. Um, this particular team did have team meetings, they just weren't well documented, so we, we improved that. And we implemented a post-implant um, huddle. This was a procedure device trial, and a lot of the, the AEs were not being reported in a timely manner post implant because the physicians were completing their, their report a, a little later, and that was outside of the protocol defined window. So we implemented that. So a lot of people would maybe think this inspection, given it was a very lengthy inspection, uh, we, it was a messy inspection, we were concerned because there was already a warning letter. Um, we wrote the lengthy uh, 483 response. We had to sit and wait. A lot of people would consider that maybe the, the bad or the ugly side of inspections, but really I see a lot of good came out of this one. So much process improvement. The study team was much stronger um, and, and had better skills after having gone through this inspection. So I really tried to see it as so much good came out of this. And every inspection, I try to look at that way because you, you kind of just have to um, or, or they will get you down and get you really stressed out. Just focus on the positive and what can come out of um, an uh, inspection. Um, so that kind of closes that. I hope your FDA inspection um, experience is a good one, or at least you've learned from the bad or the ugly outcomes of any um, inspections that you have to go through. So that is all. We didn't, I think we're doing questions after.
Liz, so that concludes our third annual FDA conference. So on behalf of the CCTS, Nationwide Children's Hospital, and the Office of Responsible Research Practices, we would like to uh, thank all of our speakers once again um, for their uh, time and effort. Um, I would like to also thank all of you for your participation um, and attendance. Um, we will be sending out a survey soon, so please keep your eye out for that. We really appreciate your feedback and um, your suggestions for future events, for future topics. Um, also, if you have any questions about um, SOCRA continuing education credits for this event, please see the registration desk out front. So um, please go out and enjoy this wonderful day.